Good people YouTube, I'm the Watch Idiot, and this video came about because one person said in the comments that it would be interesting to hear how I go about buying watches in terms of thought process and then how watches play into my personal finances. And I thought that was actually a really interesting idea just because I hadn't thought of it before necessarily, but I quickly realized that there's actually a lot of mental calculus just going on in my head subconsciously and whatnot over here when I think about maybe buying a watch. So in this video, I'm going to go over the multiple factors that do play into my decision, uh, purchase decision, thought process outside of the regular, oh, oh, you know, do I like the watch? That's not what I'm going to get into. Amongst these factors is the specter of resale value. And after that, I'm going to get into where watches play into the grand scheme of my personal finances. And of course, I do have to put out the disclaimer that absolutely none of this is financial advice because only you in the end know what you're comfortable with financially. And yeah, uh, this is just a really interesting topic. So yeah, uh, let's just get into it. Okay, first things first, I want to talk about resale value just because this is something that does play a big part throughout my thought process about whether or not I should buy a watch, but for very real reasons. And sometimes thinking about resale value comes right at the beginning of that thought process. Sometimes it comes right at the end. So I know the talk of resale value can be a bit unsavory, you know, especially the side of it that, you know, gets into like flipping and things like that, investments and all that stuff over there. But I, and that could be a whole different video on that uh, because I do have a lot of thoughts about that. But uh, my thoughts on resale value here has absolutely nothing to do with that stuff. For me, resale value is important for watches that are you know, risky in terms of my tastes and for watches that are more expensive as well. And of course, resale is directly proportional to risk and price. Obviously, the more risky, the more pricier the watch is, the more I think about resale value, except when I don't. <laughs> So for example, I used to own a Rolex Explorer 2 a couple years ago, which I've since sold. And it was and still is the most expensive watch that I have bought. And the Explorer 2 played kind of both sides of this argument in terms of that it was expensive and also it was a risk in terms of my tastes. And the risk came down to the fact that it wasn't a diver and it didn't even have any sort of timing bezel or rotatable bezel for that matter and it didn't have a black dial and it wore big for the 42 millimeter size that it was and it just kind of wore big in general. Despite all of that, I absolutely fell in love with the watch the moment I put it on my wrist and I saw it in person. I mean, the crispness of the white dial was insane and the orange GMT hand just took it to the next level, but it was a risk nevertheless. Realistically speaking, the final and main factor that really pushed me over the edge to make me buy the watch in the end was the fact that the resale value was amazing. I mean, it was nowhere as crazy as it was now, but, but it was still really great. So I knew in the back of my mind that, you know, if I buy this watch and I'm going to take this big, you know, financial hit for it, uh, at least initially that I knew that I wasn't going to just immediately burn off thousands of dollars and I also know that I'm not locking away money in something that I can't sell quickly just in case I do need to sell it for you know whatever reason it may be you know oh I just don't like it anymore or I want to buy something else instead of it uh, you know in, in place of it or you know if I just need the money quickly but then the entire thing gets flipped around uh, when I think of my x33 and that's kind of that kind of just flies in the face of everything that we just spoke about over here but once again you know I just I, I just completely fell for it the moment it I wore it on my wrist because it was just such a crazy and unique experience. I put out a whole video over here, um, so just go check that out if you want to get more details on the X33. But in the end, the risk of getting such a crazy watch was kind of pushed aside a little bit just because it was that unique within the grand scheme of my collection. So I knew that I was more or less a keeper, you know, the moment I got it. Oh, and then also additionally, I did sell off a few watches after I bought that one, just to rebuild that hole in my bank account afterwards. So in the end, should resale value be the only thing that you think of when you buy a watch? 
no just because i do feel like that can really suck the life out of the watch hobby in general to a certain extent and also in terms of the enjoyment of the watch in the moment but i do think that resale should be considered especially for watches that are you know more risky and also a little bit more expensive as well okay so now that we got that out of the way so let's get into you know what goes through my mind once when i decide that you know i like this watch okay so first question so where does it fit within my collection and this is just one of the things that i learned uh, to ask myself after a lot of past mistakes <laughs> i put a vid video out on that if you haven't seen it already check it out i used to just buy watches that i really liked without really thinking about my general collection and if it's gonna unnecessarily maybe step on the toes of other watches or be completely overshadowed by other watches and things like that so yeah i mean i quickly realized that i don't need like eighty four thousand you know black dial divers <laughs> and kind of in conjunction with that is how will it fare against the other watches in my collection and in my core collection this is probably one of the most important questions that i ask myself for example i loved my uh, Zin Yu one uh, but i ended up having to sell it i really have to think about how much i'm really gonna wear the Zin Yu one over my other favorite watches like my Tudor Pelo Ghost, my Marine Master 300, my SKXs and things like that. A lot of the time, most of the time, <laughs> the answer is that it won't be used enough over those watches or at least enough to justify spending, you know, for those watches like over two grand. Okay, so the next question is how special is it? And that's kind of just to justify the previous two questions and one way is that if I get a watch that's a little out there, I have to think like, will it just stay a little bit just too out there to even be worn enough and to to warrant the money that I spend on it? That goes for my Olek and Weiss P104 because it is quite different and it is very unique and I don't have another watch like it. And there might be a reason for that why I don't have another watch like it. So I really did have to think about the uniqueness of the watch and how special it is in the grand scheme of things and whether that was enough for me to actually go ahead and buy it. So the other way that it can go is for my, you know, my bread and butter dive watches. And, you know, I have to think about, you know, is this watch special enough to warrant once again the spot? And maybe is it too perfect? So what I mean by that is, is it something that works really well on paper and I love everything about paper, but maybe in real life it will kind of fall short? Okay, so the last question is finally, how often will I be able to wear it? And how often will I actually be able to wear it? And those are very two different, very, very two different things. And it was especially uh, important for the likes of like the Zin Yu one, my Seiko Tuna and other big divers. So I might absolutely love those watches. And I did love those watches immensely. And they're super unique and they were really good value for money, all that good stuff. And then that might be whatever I'm looking at too. But, in the end, I just know that a big and thick watch won't be worn as much as I would like to. Simple as that. So yeah, I think that those are just about all the main questions that I asked, but like I said, this is such a case-by-case -case situation uh, for watches. And so yeah, some of these questions might be more important and less important depending on the watch that's being considered. So yeah, it's just a very fluid, uh, the situation okay so where do watches play into the grand scheme of my personal finances so like i said before i am not rich <laughs> by any means and i'm not making like seven eight figures crazy money and anything of like that over there but watches for me are a gigantic part of my life and they have been for many years so that's why it ends up being a bigger part of my uh, personal finances within reason obviously so yeah I mean they just bring me so much joy every single day genuinely so much joy every single day I mean I'm always looking down at the watch on my wrist and you know just playing with it fiddling around with it seeing in different lights and just being amazed by it <laughs> whatever watch it may be and then also now that I'm at home more uh, because of COVID and things like that I mean I'm always you know visiting my other watches 
you know, playing around with them, fiddling around them, maybe switching watches and things like that throughout the day, whatever it may be. And then also, you know, at night, often it happens that, let's say at like 11 p.m., I just start looking at my other watches and then I start, start trying on my other watches. And then as I'm trying on my other watches, I start trying out different straps on different watches and then on and on and on. And then I find myself at 3 a.m. just sitting there with like all my straps out on the bed with all my watches out over there. I'm like, well, where did like four hours of my life just go over here? So, you know, is that enough to justify, you know, me allocating more money for watches? For a lot of people, it probably isn't enough to justify, but for me, I am completely comfortable with that extra allocation of money uh, towards uh, watches. Also, I might add that I do feel you know, comfortable uh, with buying watches just because enthusiast watches are quite liquid in the grand scheme of things. And by this, I mean, I can sell my watches, pretty much all of them, uh, very quickly if I need to. And I can get a lot of money back for what I'm selling. And if not, if for I mean, as you know, a lot of watches can make money. Also, I do think that it is important to note that I am not married and I don't have any kids because I know that if I did have a wife and kids, I just know that I wouldn't be able to justify the vast majority of the watch purchases that I've made. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to justify it to myself for sure. So yeah, I did originally want to get into, you know, how I buy my watches transaction wise, like cash credit or firm, things like that over there. Uh, because I do have a lot of thoughts on that topic, but that will make this video way too long. And I do think that it can be a whole separate video just because there is just, there's just so much to talk about in terms of that topic, uh, in terms of pros and cons and things like that. But um, yeah, uh, let me know if that's something that maybe you'd like to see. So yeah, I will leave it at that. And yeah, if you enjoyed the video, go ahead and hit the like button. And also, if you do want to see more videos, uh, you know, just check out the other videos that I have, you know, playlists and things like that. And also hit the subscribe button and the notification bell while you're at it, just because it does really help the channel grow and reach more people, you know, like you, uh, like you, uh, you know, and they, they might enjoy it as well. I hope so, at least. <laughs> but um, yeah, until the next video, uh, good day.